Thanks, Jeff. So uh, thank you for showing up here. Welcome to the Farminar. I'm Steve Carlson. I'm with Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, I'm here at the Ames office. And today, as you know, we're going to be talking about hazelnuts. So leading the topic for us are two guys who have some great experience with hazelnuts, Jeff Jensen and Norm Erickson. Jeff is with Trees Forever, and he's also active in a ton of groups like the Iowa Nut Growers Association, uh, Minnesota Hazelnut Foundation, and the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative. Um, Norm's one of the founding members of Minnesota Hazelnut Foundation, and Norm and his wife live and grow hazelnuts in Lake City, Minnesota. So we're glad to have these two joining us, and I'll turn it over to them here in just a minute, and they can get a little nutty. But uh, first of all, I'm going to mention a few things about Practical Farmers of Iowa for those who are not familiar. So this is part of our Winter Farminar series, and this is the last one. We started back in November, and uh, all of these are recorded, so you can go back through our archives and, and uh, see if you missed out on any of them. We've got them in there. Um, we normally do these on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, we do a couple... Uh, you know, lunchtime webinars, and we usually wrap these up in March because people start getting busy out in their fields, and so uh, we'll start these up again in November. So Practical Farmers of Iowa was started just over 30 years ago by a group of farmers who were interested in improving their profitability, their efficiency, and their stewardship, and we're still very much interested in, in those issues today. Our mission at Practical Farmers of Iowa is strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. And we use this mission uh, to help farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the land and the people. Our values at Practical Farmers of Iowa are welcoming everyone, creativity, collaboration, and community, viable farms now and for future generations, and stewardship and ecology. As a member-based organization, we'd like you to join us. We encourage you to look into our member benefits on our website. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of PFI members would agree that uh, it's really our, our membership, our community of PFI members that makes it so special. So uh, think about becoming a member and tapping into that network today. On our website, we've got an event calendar that's starting to fill up with field days and, and other you know, spring events. So um, definitely check our calendar for anything coming up in your area. I should have um, pointed out here on April 1st and April 2nd, an event that we just announced is a high tunnel building workshop that's in Jefferson, Iowa at the Deal Orchard, April 1st and 2nd. So that should be, if you're putting, if you're thinking about putting up a high tunnel, that will be a really great learning experience for you. So join us for that. It's free for PFI members, and there's a fee for non-members. Also, we announced our spring field days. These are all about cover crops and grazing cover crops. They're on the map there. You can see, hopefully, there's one near you, and you can join us. These are all free. They're all from noon to 3 p.m. on those dates. Uh, talking about a variety of issues that deal with cover crops, so hope to see you out there. And then finally, a um, couple of rules here. If you want to stay in touch with PFI's Farminars, we might do one or two this summer. If we have a pop-up Farminar, send it, I'll send an email to our Farminar list. And then in November, I'll send an email to that list announcing those, uh, those new topics that we'll start in November. Uh, so if you want to be on that farm in our list, shoot me your email address in the chat box there. Um, also, it's fun to see where people are tun tuning in for. It looks tuning in from, excuse me. It looks like Tom's in Jefferson, Iowa. Um, I'm in Ames. It's kind of nice to see. I know uh, Norm and Jeff are presenting from I think Norm's place in Lake City, Minnesota. So let us know where you're at. It's kind of fun to see that. Also, if you haven't noticed, on the lower left corner of the screen there is a little poll that's just asking people how many, how many are watching from your computer. It helps us, uh, helps us get kind of a head count on how many people are here. And like I said, this is the last one of the year because people start getting busy. So um, so I'm not too surprised that we've got a little bit of a low audience here, but we've, we are recording this. Um, okay, one more thing here. The chat box there that you guys are starting to get the hang of. Uh, while our speakers are talking, feel free to use that to ask clarifying questions. Um, they'll be happy to answer your questions. If they don't see it, 
as you as you put it in the chat box, we'll we'll circle back and get to that question at the end of their presentation. So do be thinking about your questions. Definitely utilize that chat box with these guys. We've got some experts here, so don't be shy. And then finally, at the end of the farminar, I'm going to pop up a link on the screen here for you to take a very short survey about the farminar, give us a little bit of feedback, and then also that's an opportunity for you to tell us what topics you want to learn about in the future. Um, so we will be using that list that you guys give us to plan our farminars next season and the season after that. So definitely take some time to take that survey, give us some suggestions about what you want to see. So thanks everybody for tuning in here. I am now going to step aside and, and turn it over to Norm and Jeff. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Jeff Jensen uh, at Norm Erickson's place in Lake City. And I want to welcome all of you to our presentation here on hazelnuts, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit about each of those, uh, the good aspects of hazelnuts, what's bad and what's just downright ugly. It's pretty rough. Um, a little bit about me first. Uh, my name is Jeff and I'm a field coordinator with Trees Forever in Northwest Iowa. And uh, Trees Forever is a nonprofit that works with communities to plant trees. I'm also the program manager for our Working Watersheds, Buffers and Beyond program. And I mentioned that because uh, that's available to landowners in Iowa that want to do uh, conservation projects. So this would include things like, uh, oh, prairie strips, um, CRP, or pardon me, uh, grass waterways, uh, agroforestry practices, nut and berry plantings, things like that. So if you have any interest in projects uh, and are looking for some cost share and some technical assistance, please contact me uh, at Trees Forever. The other hat that I wear is with the Iowa Nut Growers Association, uh, currently serving as president of the organization. And um, we're having our annual meeting coming up here March 25th at the Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge in Prairie City. So if anybody's interested in learning more about the Iowa Nut Growers Association, check out our website or contact me. I'm going to let Norm go ahead and uh, give you a little background and introduce himself. Howdy, folks. Well, I'm a, kind of a migrant worker here in Minnesota. I grew up in uh, northeastern Wisconsin, about an hour north of Green Bay in that. I picked hazelnuts as a kid in the 40s and early 50s along the railroad tracks up there. Uh, I got interested in hazelnuts in uh, the early 2000s, uh, primarily as a result of uh, a presentation I saw about uh, the sustainable aspects of hazelnuts and the fact that they're 60, 70 percent oil in the kernels. And we were looking at uh, peak oil issues at that time, was before we went crazy with fracking. And uh, hazelnuts have an oil that can be used pressed clarified and uh, used directly in the, as a diesel fuel. So it seemed like a good idea at the time uh, to get involved in uh, in hazelnuts as a sustainable, useful, soil-preserving uh, activity. Um, I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up in a small town and had relatives on the farm. I had a tree farm in Minnesota for about 35 years. I grew walnuts and pruned them. They look like telephone poles with hats on. And um, so anyway, uh, I have about uh, 12 acres of hazelnuts, something in the range of 4,000 bushes right now. Um, we hand pick for the first few years and uh, now are mechanically picking. Um, and we're very happy with how it works. Uh, we. I guess I could talk for an hour here as a time for some of this uh, come a little later. I think I worked uh, most of my life for IBM. That's what brought me to Minnesota. I was in the education area for uh, many years. I started off uh, as a field service rep, and I fixed machines, so I had a natural inclination to deal with mechanical things. And lucky thing, because there's not a lot of equipment on the shelf available for purchase for processing hazelnuts. Jeff and I have been involved in the development of machinery. Uh, so anyway, uh, I was in uh, education in IBM for about 40 years. I'm probably the old, oldest guy on the conference today, for what that's worth. Thanks, Norm. Thank you very much. So we're going to get right into this and talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
So a couple of points that I want to make is um, this isn't a comprehensive learn how to grow hazelnuts presentation. Just want to give you kind of an overview of uh, some opportunities and then some challenges, certainly. Um, so some of the good things. So hazelnuts are an excellent agroforestry crop. And we're going to talk just a bit about what I mean by an agroforestry crop. Certainly hazelnuts have lots of potential as a perennial crop because of the versatility of the nuts. There's a lot of different avenues that we can go down in terms of marketing these uh, nutritious little nuts. And then, of course, we can't forget that as a perennial shrub, they provide a whole host of uh, ecological services from carbon sequestration to improved water quality due to reduced wind and water erosion, just the whole nine yards. Uh, finally, Amer not finally, but American and hybrid hazelnuts are native to the Midwest and they're hardy. And that's important because a lot of times when we talk to folks about growing hazelnuts, one of the first questions I'll ask is, um, well, where are they growing right now? And can't we just take that production system and bring it to Iowa and the Midwest? And uh, the answer is no, we can't. And then finally, uh, they are conducive to mechanical harvesting. And this is crucial as well because this is a real um, bottleneck for us in terms of a lot of labor goes into picking these by hand right off the bush. So if we can find plants that are conducive to mechanical harvesting and machines that can do it, we can really drive down that labor cost and um, uh, hopefully someday be profitable. So a couple of the bad things that we need to be uh, cognizant of, and that's hazelnut development and breeding is a long-term endeavor. This isn't like corn and soybeans and other annual crops where we can make crosses, plant out the seed the next year, and within a year have some sort of analysis uh, on whether it's going to be good for, for future breeding. So it just takes a long time. There's a lot of information we don't yet know about growing hazelnuts in the Midwest. First and foremost, there aren't a whole lot of hazelnuts grown in the Midwest, point blank. Uh, there's basically no commercial production. I would consider all the plantings that we have as basically research plantings. And so we don't know a lot of things about basic things like pests, uh, best management practices, about how to grow them, spacing. So we're always learning, and that's the benefits of uh, some of the organizations like the Minnesota Hazelnut Foundation, the Iowa Nut Growers Association, is you can actually learn from other growers so you don't have to repeat those mistakes. Finally, inf industry infrastructure is not well developed at all. So this isn't like um, the traditional row crop model where every elevator can take your corn and soybeans. Uh, you just got to figure out your basis and where you want to take it. We're really talking about uh, initially direct markets. Uh, there are some opportunities now with the American Hazelnut Company potentially. Uh, but on the processing front, you need to get these things processed and cracked. And then all the support services from agronomy to um, harvesting to marketing the whole nine yards. It's a pioneer business, so uh, with it comes uh, the fun of discovery and the pain of learning. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, some of the ugly aspects that we need to address to make any progress, and that's this lack of improved plant material. Uh, that really is the key right now to um, uh, profitability and getting more hazelnuts on the landscape. Um, coinciding with that is this micro-propagation bottleneck, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, profitability is extremely challenging. I would go so far as to say that uh, I don't think there is any profitability in it right now. We simply need to have better plants and a better production system. Uh, but someday down the road, by incorporating things like um, livestock and, and stacking where we're, the enterprises that we're putting these hazelnuts on, uh, there's going to be some potential down the road. Yeah, if you're not dependent on uh, hazelnuts or wouldn't become dependent on hazelnuts to feed yourself, there's a lot of fun and personal satisfaction and involvement right now. Excellent, excellent. So we're going to jump right into it, uh, the good. Hazelnuts are good agroforestry crop. But what do we mean by agroforestry? And so I like to tell people that agroforestry is really this marriage between forestry and between agriculture. And it's a marriage because one doesn't dominate the other. We're growing trees and shrubs and other perennials uh, in an ag setting for a profit motive. Uh, this isn't a hobby. This isn't gardening. We're really trying to develop the plants and the systems that can be profitable down the road. Um, basically, it's this intentional combining of agriculture and working trees and shrubs to create these sustainable farming and ranching systems. Many times agroforestry is really known by the practices themselves. So oftentimes, if I'm giving a presentation to a group of people, I'll say, raise your hand if you know what agroforestry is. And there'll maybe be a handful of people that'll raise their hand, but most won't. But then I'll ask them, who knows what a windbreak is? Who knows what a riparian buffer is? Who knows what alley cropping is? And of course, most of them will raise their hand. And so it's these practices that we really are familiar with. But the uh, overall, it's this system of agroforestry. And finally, in a nutshell, 
Now the puns are going to be present because I am president of the Iowa Nut Growers Association and Norm and I are nut growers, so just get used to it, right? So in a nutshell, it's putting the right plant in the right place for the right purpose. So when we look at these agroforestry practices and how hazelnuts could potentially be incorporated into them, alley cropping is just a natural fit. So this is growing uh, uh, row crops or um, forage between wide rows of permanent trees or shrubs so that you can maintain or realize, pardon me, some sort of short-term uh, revenue with the, the row crops or the forage while the longer-term rows of trees and shrubs are growing and developing. So alley cropping has a lot of opportunities in terms of an agroforestry practice that can incorporate hazelnuts. Certainly windbreaks and shelter belts are another option. Here it's just important to, to recognize what the goal is. If the goal is to control snow and, and wind, then certainly hazelnuts are a viable plant to put in that windbreak system. Uh, but if your uh, goal is production, to get nuts to sell for profit, uh, it might be important to recognize that snow drifts can freeze and thaw and snap off uh, stems and actually lead to a potential uh, reduction in yield. So it's just really about understanding what your goal is. But they are a multifunctional crop that can be utilized in windbreaks and shelter belts. Riparian forest buffers. Uh, I want to point out that riparian forest buffers are really a system. We, we collectively call them riparian forest buffers, but it's a system that um, incorporates many different components. So here we have this system that shows the crop. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we really have this system where we have the uh, crop uh, being buffered by your native grasses and forbs. Uh, and this is going to be the leading edge to take some of that potential runoff. Uh, next to that native and grass forb is going to be your uh, leading line of shrubs, followed by some different uh, fast and slow growing trees as you get closer and closer to the open water source to the river or stream. Um, and so in this system, hazelnuts are not a true riparian species because they don't like wet feet. So when we talk about using hazelnuts in a potential riparian forest buffer, it's really on the upland portion uh, where, the crop, uh, where the crop is so that we don't have drainage issues because hazelnuts in a production setting don't like wet feet. So hazelnuts have lots of potential as a perennial crop. And this has to do with uh, the versatility of the nuts and what you can do with them as well as then the uh, deep root systems that emerge from these perennial shrubs. So let's talk nuts a little bit. This is one of the things that really got Norm excited when he started to investigate hazelnuts. So these things are basically 50 to 60 percent oil by weight and the oil is almost identical to olive oil which is our healthiest uh, oil to cook with, bake with, and consume. Uh, in fact the number one adulterated food in the entire world is olive oil that's been cut with hazelnut oil so that the uh, traders can get um, can mislabel the hazelnut oil as a higher value olive oil product. Uh, you got to be careful when you buy hazelnut oil. Uh, we bought from a half a dozen different sources on the web, and, and we always keep it in the refrigerator to keep it fresh for long term storage. And some of it turns into what looks like uh, um, facial cream. It just turns into a white solid lump, and some of it has. Uh, filamentaceous uh, looking structures that form in the refrigerator. What it says to us is that it's not pure olive oil like we think we're purchasing. Our oil that we press is a bright, bright yellow that uh, almost glows. And we've never been able to buy any oil that approaches it for brilliance of color. So it's good stuff. This hazelnut oil is high quality. And you can see the picture there of that uh, bright uh, yellow color. So, you know, the uses are just immense. Uh, so we have the nuts themselves that can be used as a snack. Uh, they can be put into all sorts of different ingredients. Uh, we have the oil that can be used uh, certainly for salads and baking and biodiesel and, and anything you can do with a soybean, you can basically do with a hazelnut and probably even better because the fatty acid profile is better. Uh, I'm going to let Norm talk a little bit about some of the cosmetic sides because he's got some experience uh, marketing uh, hazelnut oil for cosmetics. You know, we do. We market everything that we grow at a big market up in Minneapolis. On twice a month, we go to the Mill City Market. We always sell out. Typically, by halfway through the morning, with as much as we're able to take up, and uh, we we sell the oil 
uh, for uh, in two ounce flint glass bottles with a glass dropper, we sell a two ounce bottle typically for thirty dollars, two for fifty, and uh, we get repeat customers that email us to order it and have it shipped. Uh, it's an incredible oil. It's antibacterial, antifungal, anti um, bad stuff. <laughs> And uh, but people love it. It's got a mild sunscreen effect. Uh, it's a healing oil. It keeps uh, a wound protected and moisturized. It's a skin moisturizer, and uh, we've used it on surgical wounds. My wife had some uh, melanomas removed, and she had uh, she put her finger where it didn't belong in one of the machines at the farm one night when it was late, and it ripped about a half inch opening on the finger above the second joint and uh, you could see the muscle in the sinew was a mess and she didn't want to go to the ER so next morning it looked so bad she called about going in and getting it stitched they wouldn't take her because it was over five hours or four hours since the wound occurred and they're concerned about an infection anyway she she just took care of it herself she rinsed it with hydrogen peroxide and water and uh, she kept hazelnut oil on the wound and wrapped it with gauze and put a few drops on the gauze and it within a week she was able to put on a, a rubber glove and work in the garden with it and it healed with absolutely no uh, irritation or inflammation or infection and uh, she's had that kind of thing happen on another surgery on two surgeries and that wound and uh, we use it in cuts and scratches and dry skin cracked skin it's a very light oil that when people try it at the market they're just amazed at how well it spreads and, how, and when it soaks in there's no shine no stickiness no unpleasant odor there's no additives it's just absolutely pure hazelnut oil and uh, so it's the high value uh, product from hazelnuts we don't sell it for a food although it's edible um, we're not licensed. We don't press our oil in a commercial kitchen. So um, that works out good. And there's a lot of other uses besides the oil, too. Certainly, uh, Norm touched upon the high value of the cosmetics industry. And so that's very promising. Uh, but beyond the oil, you got the other side, which is the meal. And so that meal can be utilized, uh, ground up into a flour, added to any of your baked goods. If you ever have pancakes, add some of that flour or meal to it, and you'll never go back to regular pancakes again. It's delicious. I have two microbreweries that are waiting for press cake from pressing oil for flavoring beer. I talked to the brewmaster at the brewery down in Wisconsin Dells, and they have a beer they call their hazel beer, and they said it's their best-selling beer. So it doesn't take a lot, I'm told, to flavor beer, and uh, that's where we'll be putting that, what would otherwise be a waste product for us. Hey, stay tuned. That sounds like an excellent use of that product. Thanks, Norm. So you know, moving on to a couple other good um, issues that we can talk about, and that's the American and hybrid hazelnuts are native to the Midwest and hardy. And this is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, we have some late spring freezes sometimes that can wreak havoc on things like chestnuts and our peaches, uh, where we can get uh, tip dye back and, and really see some suppressed yields. That's not really an issue with hazelnuts. Uh, oftentimes, pollination is happening uh, mid-March uh, uh, into um, uh, April, and even if we get some snow or inclement weather, uh, pollination isn't really affected. So uh, that's important. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, we're talking about these hybrid hazelnuts, and it's important to, to step back just a little bit and, and let people understand what we're, what we're talking about. So there's three main species of hazelnuts that are here in the United States. The European hazelnut, which is the great big nuts that you see in the store grown on trees up in Oregon and Washington State. Uh, that is an industry. It's well developed. Uh, Oregon State University has led that effort since the 1950s. They have cultivars. They have breeding programs. Uh, the European hazelnuts are basically the standard. Then we have the American hazelnut. They've been growing here for close to a century. So when we talk about the American hazelnut, as Norm just mentioned, they have been growing here for, for hundreds or thousands of years. So they've developed in concert with our local um, uh, ecosystem. The European hazelnut has been imported, as it alludes to, from Europe. So they uh, are more inclined to a temperate climate. That's why they're growing up in Oregon and Washington, where it doesn't get real cold. 
uh, and then they have these large nut sizes where the American hazelnut is basically this multi-stemmed bush form, uh, much smaller nuts, much thicker shells. And then the beaked hazelnut is another species found in parts of Appalachia and in the Ohio River Valley. And it's, again, a small native nut uh, that has a huge husk that comes around it. And so these hybrid hazelnuts basically are the American hazelnut base that have been uh, crossbred with the European and the beaked hazelnuts. Um, typically, they're going to be a little bit larger in size than the strictly American hazelnuts, and they're going to have thinner shells than the strictly American hazelnuts. Um, here's a nice slide that shows this beaked hazel the uh, Corlys cornuta, the American hazel Corlys americana, and this European hazel, which is the Corlys avalana. And you can see, where's my little uh, button here for the arrow? You can see how these uh, husks come all the way around um, the uh, nut itself, where with the avalana, this is the European hazelnut, uh, the husk barely covers the nut itself, and with our American hazelnuts, typically the husk does encapsulate the entire nut cluster. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about hybrid hazelnuts and what's native here to the Midwest. Uh, these are the male catkins, so the pollen shedders. Uh, typically this time of year, they're going to elongate, and the pollen, which is shown as this uh, kind of yellowish stuff here, is going to start floating away into the orchard where it will be picked up by these little flowers here, and you can see that dime there for context. Uh, I want to thank Roy Serling for these pictures here. But uh, this then, if we get a, a piece of pollen, uh, is going to be a nut cluster that will form anywhere from two, four, potentially six nuts could be uh, out of this nut cluster itself. So. So the question we get a lot of times is, well, why can't we just import the Oregon model? Why can't we bring their plants to the Midwest? They've got a well-defined and um, uh, well-developed industry, and there's a couple of challenges with that. Based, basically, the European genetics, and that means they're not very cold hardy, so that means if the plants come to the Midwest here, they'll either die, or um, what's a little bit more typical is the male catkins will potentially freeze off, and if you get the male catkins that'll freeze off, then you have an issue with pollination because you don't have that pollination, or that pollen that's there that's necessary. And the other big thing is eastern filbert blight. And we haven't really talked about it too much, but eastern filbert blight is the main disease concern with hazelnuts. Uh, filbert is just another name for hazelnuts. And eastern filbert blight is, is a concern because it's not the same everywhere. So what that means is the eastern filbert blight out in Oregon is a little bit different than what might be here in Iowa, which might be a little bit different than what's in northern Minnesota and Wisconsin, which might be a little bit different than what's out in, uh, in the east coast. And so although these... Oregon or European hazelnuts have been bred to be resistant, or I should say tolerant to EFB. When you bring them to the Midwest here, they're susceptible to our flavor of EFB, where the American or hybrid hazelnuts, because they've co-evolved uh, for hundreds of years, thousands of years, are naturally resistant or tolerant to the EFB that we have here in the Midwest. So those are the real challenges with just bringing that production system here to the Midwest. I like to throw in a little factoid. People say, well, these hazelnuts, are they filberts? Are filberts hazelnuts? And the answer is yes. And uh, the name filbert came from Europe where uh, they were called filberts. Hazelnuts were called filberts because they ripened about the time of St. Filbert's Day on the church calendar. Isn't that an interesting bit of useless information? <laughs> Excellent. So the final thing is uh, conducive to mechanical harvesting. And, and this is important because right now, basically almost all growers uh, pick their nut clusters by hand from the bush. And uh, it's extremely labor intensive. Uh, the figures that I have are basically a dollar to a dollar 25 per pound just in labor cost to pick these off of the bush. So uh, a lot of labor goes into getting these things harvested. So I'm actually going to turn this over to Norm and let him talk just a little bit about these uh, mechanical harvesters, because this is the, the um, a unit that he co-owns with a couple of other growers. Norm? Yeah, hi. This is made by Blueberry Equipment Incorporated over in the lower peninsula of Michigan. And uh, it's an ox of a machine that we found on Craigslist and went over and bought and dragged back to Minnesota. <clears throat> It's uh, self-powered. There's an old Waukesha engine up top in the back there. I think it's about 130, 130 horsepower, and it drives a three-phase generator and a Sunstrand uh, hydraulic pump, uh, hydraulic unit for uh, uh, 
driving the the wheels and uh, hydraulic cylinders for leveling it. The driver sits on the de on the deck up in the front there, where you see the steering wheel, and it's an amazing steering system. The front wheels each are encased in a cage, and the cages can be rotated by a rack and pinion system, so you can turn that wheel and basically turn on a dime. You can turn the wheels 90 degrees, and they'll drive at 90 degrees to the direction of travel. And uh, there's a couple of hydraulic levers up there, so you can raise and lower the uh, left side or the right side or the front or the rear independently. And uh, there's a tunnel that you can see that's a little over three feet wide, and uh, there's some slappers in there that are driven by motors or three-phase motors, and um, so they it whips the bush back and forth rapidly. This particular picture shows it going over a row of aronia bushes. It was kind of an experiment to see how it worked out. Uh, these are young bushes. The speed of the slappers can be adjusted by the operator so that you can run them at, with lower force on the first picking and then we can we typically use the bush for two pickings and i can pick my uh, about 12 acres of hazels in just a little over a half a day uh, and we pick twice a year and we get virtually everything in the first years when we had pickers out there um, <laughs> It's kind of funny, you know, pickers out in the field with uh, cigarettes and cell phones who get, don't get a lot done and they forget they picked only half of a bush. It's like so, watching dollar bills go down the toilet. I can attest to that with Norm. It's tough. Yeah. So anyway, the well, I had a guy who used to come to the field after the pickers had finished and to glean. He'd go in there and pick what was left after the leaf fall had started and there's there would be nuts hanging on bushes that were missed by the pickers. They were easy to find. He came out after we had picked with the mechanical picker for the first time. He said it was a waste of time. There was nothing left out there for him. So it's a, it was an amazing machine and a good investment for us. Excellent. And it's just important to point out that um, while this BEI over-the-row harvester um, has been demonstrated to work pretty well uh, with Norm and his, his fellow growers, we really need the plants uh, that are going to be conducive to being picked. So clonal material that's going to ripen relatively within the same time frame so that ideally we could just run through that uh, planting one time, maybe twice, and get most of those nuts. Plus then that uniformity um, is also going to help with the ripening because um, right now sometimes you go through and you're getting some that are maybe slightly unripe, some that have already fallen to the ground. And so it'll just really tighten things up once we get better plant material. One of the questions you might have is, well, what happens to the nuts? as it goes through the beaters <clears throat> and what happens to the bushes. Well, first of all, we've seen dazed-looking little baby mice come out the back end unhurt <laughs> and a lot of lace wings and other insects that uh, ride it out and end up in the, in the, with the nuts coming out the back end. On the back end of the machine, you're looking at the front end. On the back end of the machine, there are some little decks that uh, tote uh, tender rides on on each side, and the tote tender removes a full tote and uh, puts in a, an empty one as you go down the row and uh, picks out sticks that might end up in there. Sometimes there's a little bit of dead material that shows up in sticks and they, they interfere with uh, uh, some other processes down the line, so they kind of watch and pick that stuff out. Anyway, the tote tender's on the back end there. Uh, I kept fairly busy. It's a noisy position sitting below the engine exhaust. <laughs> That's where the uh, the less desirable employees go, the ones that uh, aren't picking very well. Yeah, the nuts, when they, the bushes are swayed back and forth fairly rapidly and uh, are undamaged, as near as we can tell, and uh, the nuts fly off and drop straight down in some cases where there are pans that spread out as we pass over the row and uh, the pins are sloped and the nuts slide down into conveyors which are right below the, the outer walls, right below the walls of the tunnel. A lot of the nuts fly off and hit the walls of the tunnel and drop down to the conveyors and the conveyors take them out to the back end where there's a blower that blows an, an airstream through the 
whatever drops off the conveyor. So if there's leaves that come off, the leaves are pretty much blown away and the nuts fall and the nuts in the husk fall down into the totes. Excellent. So we're excited about the opportunities going forward with mechanical harvesting. So that's kind of the good uh, when we talk about the hazelnuts. Now we're going to talk about the bad. And uh, one of the biggest ones is that hazelnut development and breeding is just this long-term endeavor. Uh, we're, do we're not talking annual plants where we can do selective crosses, plant out that seed, and in a year or two have some sort of result. Uh, the figure that uh, we throw around is that it takes roughly 17 years from a promising plant to an eventual release to growers. And this is uh, from work that the uh, Oregon State University has done, and they've been doing it since the 50s to develop better um, cultivars. And um, so it takes time to select that nut, make those crosses, plant that nut, let that tree grow up, and then actually start producing nuts. Take four, five, six, seven years of data uh, on a producing plant to see if it's worth it before you can actually make any recommendations. When we looked at some, when we look at some of this improved plant material timeline, um, basically some hybrid selections from our Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative group are going to be coming online in 2018 for replicated field trials. So this is not out to growers, but out to a select uh, group of individuals and research farms to see how several different cultivars or experimental genotypes might do. The Hazelnut Consortium, which is uh, Rutgers University, Nebraska University, Nebraska, Arbor Day Farms, and Oregon State University, also has some promising plant material that will be included in that those joint performance trials. Um, then we get some of the uh, Hazelnut Americana selections from the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative. It'll be certainly into the 20s before any of those are ready for release. And then any back crosses between um, um, plants from the consortium and the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative would be 2027. And then material from private breeders, who knows? Who really knows? The point is, is it's a tireless job. And of course, nobody wants to fund perennial plant breeding if it takes 15 to 20 years to get something. I would say it's not a tireless job. It's an endless job. Yeah. Yeah. Endless. That's right. So here's the big thing. There's still a ton of information we don't know about growing hazelnuts in the Midwest. So we don't have best management practices that have been developed for hazelnut production in the Midwest here. Certainly, Oregon does. Uh, they have spacing figured out. They have cultivars. They have the right male pollinizers to go with the right female plants. We don't have any of that. So some basic questions uh, that we're always trying to answer, and the list keeps getting longer because there's always more and more questions to answer, uh, are some of these. So this in-row spacing, between-row spacing, the cultivar question, weed control, pest control, some of this long-term maintenance, and then what sort of uh, endeavors can we get into, whether it's livestock or companion crops, to really improve the economics and financials of growing hazelnuts. Well, on the spacing front, it's all over the place. Uh, here's a planting where they went five feet between plants and 15 feet between rows. Uh, here's another planting where they actually put 10 feet between plants and 10 feet between rows um, to give a little bit more space for those uh, uh, bushes to express themselves. Uh, here's a, oh, there's the water wagon. Wanted to point that one out. So water is very important uh, for these hazelnuts the first couple years of establishment. So you have to have water in some way, shape, or form. This one, this planting, incidentally, also has the drip tape irrigation, as you can see there underneath the landscape fabric and the mulch. Um, this planting, in particular, was 6 feet between plants, 12 feet between rows. Um, and if you look at this planting today, it's almost grown together. In fact, uh, this particular row where this picture was taken in the fall of 2015, uh, this last fall when we tried to harvest this row, we couldn't get through it. We had to go underneath it and um, kind of work our way. So we've been pruning it here this fall to really uh, uh, prune back some of the older stems and really clean some things up between those rows. But uh, row spacing, it's a big question. You know, weed control. We know that landscape fabric is good, but can we do landscape fabric? Uh, what are some alternatives to landscape fabric? Can we use um, uh, herbicides? Can we use mulch? Uh, this particular planting was... Um, Landscape fabric and mulch. Uh, oh, again, there's the, the water issue. I know Norm, in his production, uh, some of the early years, he did some different things. Norm, why don't you share that? Yeah, when we first started, our first immediate concern was animal predation. We started off with a soybean field that had soybeans in for a month and a half, two months, and they were getting pretty big. And we tilled three-foot aisles in the soybeans and uh, planted our plants about six feet apart and uh, on bare dirt and uh, we were pretty aggressive when we started running a clean field we rototilled between rows 
and we used Roundup and we killed back any uh, grasses or weeds that came up. And so the, the plants were pretty, pretty conspicuous out there. But one of the things we found out after a while, you could spit out there and get erosion practically. And so we ended up planting a, a lawn grass, a perennial ryegrass as a cover in, in most areas. We also experimented with Kura clover, uh, which gets quite large. It's a red clover developed in Korea, very cold hardy. And we also put in some white Dutch clover. And uh, uh, I can say the white Dutch clover, one of the drawbacks of it is it per makes a pretty nice uh, cover for tunneling by voles and mice. The only place I've ever seen any any kind of uh, chewing uh, by, of rod by rodents of uh, bark is where I had uh, snow cover over white Dutch. Elsewhere in the field, I've had no problem. We always have uh, mulched our seedlings, our new planting with wood chips, which we get from the city. I mean, most most areas where you have uh, forests and uh, power lines with trees growing underneath, you have uh, um, yeah wood chips available. That most of these guys will chip up the their trimmings and put them into trailers or a box truck. Um, that they're pulling their chipper with, and they have to have a place to dump them. And uh, we find that uh, they're happy to bring them out to us and give them to us. It gives them a second purpose in life, and they're happy to deliver them. We get all we need free. In fact, we've been mulching our field with leaves that we get free from the city, about 120 tons a year we spread with an old manure spreader to try to build the organic content of the soil and increase its water holding capacity. So we've about tripled what we've got for organics in the soil. Excellent. Thanks for sharing, Norm. So a couple other things that we just don't know. Uh, the cultivar issue is one that uh, I'm going to talk about here in just a little bit. Uh, but what's the best way to grow these things out? You know, bare root dormant seedlings are going to have more um, uh, root mass to them. They're going to be potentially easier to establish if we can use some mechanical tree planters. Uh, certainly, uh, industry standard is the banded pots that are roughly four inches by nine inches that give you a nice root system. So a couple of uh, additional things that we don't quite know. What about these pest issues? So certainly, uh, eastern filbert blight is a, a concern, but there's also things like the Japanese beetle. Here's the Japanese beetle are starting to completely defoliate this hazelnut bush. There's other pests like uh, the marmorated stink bug. Uh, big bud mite is one that a couple of growers have really expressed some concern about. Um, <clears throat> then there's pests like deer and uh, blue jays. Blue jays are nut thieves. I hate blue jays with a passion, but I'll get off that. So there's all sorts of different things that you have to be aware of. People ask me about predation and, and squirrels, and I say plant enough so they get full before they're gone, then you get some. <laughs> Excellent. What we don't know, we also don't know about long-term uh, pruning, uh, maintenance. Uh, so some growers uh, let their, their trees grow up and then compass them all the way to the ground for new growth. Uh, other woody crops, uh, there's specific pruning regimes where you're going to take some of the older wood, open up that bush to improve uh, sunlight penetration, which can help to rejuvenate the plant. So a couple of additional things that we just don't know and uh, need to be researched further. Finally, when we talk about the bad, we have to address the, the uh, whole issue of industry infrastructure is basically not well developed from markets to the processing to some of the support services. So one of the questions we get, is there even an industry? And the answer is yes, there is a hazelnut industry in the United States, and it's in Oregon, where 99% of all production uh, occurs. And so our challenge in the Midwest here is to build an industry basically from scratch, from the ground up, based on these uh, American or hybrid hazelnuts that are bush form, uh, grown in agroforestry settings for the environmental benefit. Because if you know anything about the Oregon model, they basically keep the ground completely black and bare beneath those trees. They let the nuts fall to the ground, they sweep them up, and then they suck them up and blow all the leaves and dirt away. And uh, for a conservation crop, that's just not going to cut it for us. It's a dirty job. You can go on YouTube and I think it's Freddie guys had some videos on there showing their harvesting and they're just machinery running through a cloud of dust. It's a mess. So what's needed when we talk about developing an industry? Certainly the growers, the breeders, the propagators, agronomists, processors, these value-added um, enterprises that can, can sprout up, and then the scientists to help drive some of the research and the improved breeding. You know, another big obstacle has been uh, machinery. 
And so that's something that uh, Norm has been fiddling with for basically a decade, is trying to either develop or find machinery for small scale. So certainly there are plenty of uh, nut processing companies that make nut processing equipment for the almond industry, for the pecan industry, for the black wa or for the uh, English walnut industry. Uh, I've been to California to a couple of them, had some conversations, but we're talking about units that are doing maybe five to 10,000 pounds an hour and cost $150,000. We really need to focus on something small scale that the small scale growers that we have can collectively come together and either own themselves or as a collective group and get these things processed. Anything to add, Norm? Yeah, I've developed several nutcrackers. Each one was the best on the planet. Each each <laughs> one each one wasn't. I mean, the idea isn't quite as good as the reality, and or the reality it turned out to be deficient. And uh, I've got a new nutcracker right now that was just put together that I hope to get running in the next few weeks. So it's a never-ending process of always continually improving uh, some of the equipment that we've developed or uh, modifying existing equipment. One one thing I, I failed to mention earlier was when we market our nuts in the farmer's market, we sell only roasted nuts and uh, we bag them up in quarter-pound bags, which we sell for $5 a piece. And we sample them with a little tiny spoon. We give people one or two kernels to sample as they're coming through the market. They just about can't walk away from them. They taste so good. People, once they've eaten those roasted hazelnuts, say that it's the best nut they ever ate, and they don't want to eat anything else. They're great in salads as an accent. They're a small nut with big flavor. They're incredible. And, Excellent. And we roast ours, dry roast them in a uh, convection oven. Yep, toasted hazelnuts are fantastic. Unbelievable how much the uh, flavor really gets enhanced by roasting them. So when we look at some of the really big challenges, uh, this is the ugly. So this is the stuff that uh, basically needs to be addressed before we can move hazelnuts forward, and it's a tough slog right now. And so the first one is lack of improved plant material. So um, basically, we have no cultivars of hazelnuts. Um, I say that loosely because there potentially are some older cultivars like Rush and and um, Winkler that were the basis for some of the hybrids that are out there today. Uh, Grand Traverse is one that the University of Nebraska is working with. But when we talk about some of these experimental genotypes, we're basically talking about plants that growers have in their planting that are good plants for some reason. And so all of the uh, samples that you see there on the uh, screen are individuals that came from somebody's planting and and for some reason, they thought they were good nuts. But when you crack them out on the bottom row there, you can see that some are not good nuts. They don't have good kernels to them. Other ones have fantastic kernels. So the other thing to keep in mind is some uh, plants are consistent across sites and some are not. And that makes sense because some uh, sites are going to have more nutrients, better soil, uh, longer growing degree days than other sites. But a clear example of this is going to be on the far right of this um, slide here where you have this Eric 421 plant at St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, nice big kernels when it goes to Bayfield, Wisconsin, uh, up in northern Wisconsin, much smaller kernels. The same can be said for this Staples nine or N76 and this uh, Lamb 58N. But um, hand fats is relatively consistent. This uh, Rosemont 1412 is relatively consistent. So a few of the different variabilities between sites so kernel size is typically small, but the quality is typically pretty high. And so um, here's a nice big nut from Minar 342, nice kernel size. Um, and so this is what we're trying to get to. Each one of these samples could be a potential cultivar down the road, but they first need to be uh, analyzed in replicated field trials on growers' farms throughout the Midwest from Canada all the way down to Illinois. And that work is going to be getting started here in uh, fall 2017 or spring 2018. Next slide. So this is an, a nice little chart, and I'll give everybody a little time to look at it and take it in. And so we just basically, on the left-hand column, have the, the genotype, the experimental genotype. Uh, and then we have the three different sites, uh, Bayfield, Wisconsin, St. Paul, Minnesota, and then Lake City right here at Norm's Planting. And it just shows you the pounds of kernel per acre equivalent for those different genotypes in those two years at the sites. And, and then as a comparison, we have the Oregon yields here, which uh, should be about 600 pounds per acre at age 6 and about 1,400 pounds per acre at age 12. So we have a lot of room for improvement. Uh, 
when Jason Fishbach uh, put together his um, productivity uh, bulletin on the uh, MidwestHazelnuts.org website, uh, basically the figure is the average yield per plant in the Midwest is 1.68 pounds per plant. And that's simply not going to cut it in terms of a viable perennial crop. We need to have plants that are producing 5, 7, 10 pounds uh, per bush to really be productive and make hazelnuts fly as a profitable crop. My best bush produced 11.9 pounds. Nice, nice. So this issue of improved plant material is, is a real issue. So how do we address it? Well, micropropagation is the way that we can get hundreds or even thousands of plants from a piece of juvenile growing tissue. We basically grow things in petri dishes and then take those individual plants and um, uh, put them in a growing medium and eventually we get uh, thousands of plants. But the real struggle here is that different experimental genotypes have different success rates in micropropagation. And so where we have some uh, that are going to micropropagate easily, we have others that are virtually impossible to micropropagate. So the question becomes, in our list here of uh, promising genotypes, which one or several of them are going to be easy to micropropagate and which will be difficult? And so that's where the, uh, the bottleneck is occurring right now. Another way to get clonal material, to get clonal plants, is mound layering. And this is a cheap uh, on-the-farm method for getting clones, but you can only get roughly 4 to 10 uh, every single year. And so the method we're using here is basically um, cutting the bush down to the ground, letting the new shoots come up, tying a twisty tie around the base of that stem, putting some rooting hormone above that, keeping the whole thing covered up with moist sawdust so that as the plant grows, it grows into that restriction of the twisty tie, and it'll send out new roots above that constriction point. You can come back in the fall, snap off that stem, and now you have a clone of that mother plant. So it's cheap, but it doesn't uh, get very many plants. So it's not going to work to get cultivars out onto the landscape. And here is uh, a couple of clones that uh, came from my farm where we snapped them off, and then I replanted those to the place that I wanted to, uh, to uh, put them for their final planting spot. So the final thing that we would just want to talk about and touch upon is uh, the profitability. So because we're dealing with open pollinated seedlings where basically every single plant is different in all of these growers' plantings, uh, the variability is all over the place. So yeah. some good plants, some bad plants. Go ahead, Norm. The bushes are all mutt bushes. <laughs> mutt bushes. With, yeah, with uh, kind of uh, unpredictable genetics. You buy a bunch of seedlings that'll, that are hybrids, and uh, you may have the best bush in the country. You may have a bunch of losers. I mean, we... We don't do any pruning in our field, uh, with two exceptions. One, since we're mechanically picking, we have some bushes that have become kind of wide, and uh, so there's not good light penetration to the center. And so, I, I've got an old uh, Home Light XL brush cutter with a 10-inch saw blade on it. It's like a chainsaw on, or like a table saw on the stick, and I can go in and uh, and narrow up a bush by whacking off some of the stems on each side and so I can be kind of elongate the bush by cutting off some of the side growth because they spread by rhizomes like uh, uh, a lot of other bushes. So when we talk about profitability I, I want to point out that uh, there's a couple of documents I'd like to reference and the first one is uh, it's called a landowner's guide to perennial crop options. I'm going to say that again it's a landowner's guide to perennial crop options. And that can actually be found at the Trees Forever website. Uh, you can download the entire document or chapter by chapter. And it uh, takes an in-depth look at six different perennial crops. The crops are aronia berries, black walnuts, chestnuts, Christmas trees, elderberries, and hazelnuts. And for each of those crops, we provide some necessary background information and then an enterprise budget worksheet. Uh, in addition to the enterprise budget worksheet, we actually developed a 20-year financial model uh, these perennial crops take uh, quite a bit longer to uh, realize profitability because oftentimes five, seven, ten years uh, go by where we're just putting growth into the bush itself or the tree itself without any sort of um, a yield, whether it's nuts or berries. And so on the hazelnut front, uh, things are pretty ugly because we have low productivity right now. So each bush isn't producing very much. And um, establishment costs are going to run 5000 to $15,000, depending on if you go the the 
uh, gold standard method of landscape fabric, drip tape irrigation, tree tubes, uh, full fertilization, uh, the whole nine yards. You can get by with um, a much cheaper establishment cost if you don't go the uh, Cadillac style, but then you're going to have other issues to deal with down the road. We, it depends somewhat on your soil type. We didn't do all of that. When we planted into that soybean field and tilled things and mulched, I tried landscape fabric the first year and we didn't have much snow cover and the wind whipped across the field and it peeled the landscape fabric back and made a mess. And uh, so what we did was we watered, I think twice with, uh, I put a big tank in the back of my pickup truck and put a little generator back there and a half horse pump and 50 foot of garden hose. and so. I'd pump water out of the tank, and I could water up and down 100 feet on each side, roughly. And we do that twice, and uh, wood chips that tend to hold the moisture and suppress the weeds. It worked very well. We lost virtually nothing for plants in the first years. And uh, well, that's, that's in, the, in a nutshell. Excellent. Then on the flip side, when we start talking about selling hazelnuts, uh, so in shell nuts that have been cleaned are going to go anywhere from a dollar to a dollar fifty per pound, um, and then of course they have to be processed. So they got to be sized, sanitized, cracked, separated, and sorted. And I can assure you, uh, it's tedious work going through by hand separating shells from kernels. Now kernels uh, that you'd buy in a store are going to go anywhere from uh, ten dollars per pound all the way up to twenty dollars per pound, depending on if they're uh, uh, cheap Oregon, or pardon me, if they're cheap imported nuts from Turkey or other locations, or if they're Oregon nuts, or are much more expensive hazelnuts from the Midwest here because of the added labor that we have uh, that goes into them. The other thing, they're, they're worth it. They're definitely worth it. The other thing to keep in mind is we're looking at a, uh, a hazelnut that has about 30% kernel or 33% kernel, where the uh, Oregon nuts are about 50% kernel. So when you do the math, um, it, it takes more of our nuts to get a pound of kernels uh, than the Oregon nuts. And so um, when you do the math, uh, it's not very much revenue generated uh, to cover those costs. But uh, the opportunities for improvement are going to rely in reducing our labor through mechanical harvesting, through improved plant material that will do uh, simply get more pounds per bush, as well as tighten up the quality uh, of those bushes. So. Right now, we're picking everything, even the crappy bushes. If we can get some improved plant material, uh, in theory, there won't be any crappy bushes. They'll all be relatively uniform in their uh, size and yields. Uh, this is all need to be proven yet. Uh, hopefully, these joint performance trials that are getting started here will uh, lead to some good information that we can share with folks in four to five years down the road. So stay tuned. With that, questions? Oh, acknowledgments. Uh, I forgot the slide. I want to be sure I acknowledge a couple of folks. I'd like to acknowledge Jason Fishbach with the University of Wisconsin Extension. A couple of the slides in my presentation came from him. I'd also like to acknowledge Lois Brown with the University of uh, Minnesota. She's the hazelnut researcher there. A couple of the slides came from her. Certainly the National Agroforestry Center uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, they do great work at the National Agroforestry Center, and a couple of my slides came from that organization. And then finally, the University of Missouri's Agroforestry Center. Uh, all of those entities, or pardon me, both of those entities, the National Agroforestry Center in Lincoln, Nebraska, and the University of Minis Missouri's Agroforestry Center are ones you can access via the website, and you could spend hours looking through information on agroforestry systems and crops. So if you're interested in chestnuts, go down to the University of Missouri's agroforestry page because they've got tons of stuff on chestnuts and mushrooms and elderberries and you name it. Now I'll take some questions. Yeah, fantastic, guys. Um, really tons of really good information, so thanks for sharing that. Um, if I'll need time for questions, looks like Tom's got one. I was going to ask that uh, same question, Tom. So... Here's going to be my take on uh, where to purchase hazelnut bushes, and this is the standard response I get, and Norm and others might have a different response, but basically people that are growing and selling seedlings, uh, you can put the seedlings in if you're looking to do an agroforestry practice like a snow fence, or you need to use a functional uh, plant to, to do something. If production is what you're interested in, um, I would strongly encourage you to find somebody close to you that has some plants that may have kept track of some plants and see if you can get some of their better plants. 
uh, because if I had to do it all over again, I never would have put in the roughly 1,000 plants that I have right now because there's a lot of mutts out there and a lot of junk. I would have been a lot more strategic and tried to find some, uh, if not cultivars, because we really don't have cultivars, experimental genotypes that folks have kept track of, and at least I know that they're going to have some level of production in some form that's going to be useful to me. The other thing I'll mention is you can also uh, Google um, MidwestHazelnuts.org, and that is the website for the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative, and there is a list of growers on that page uh, that you can purchase nuts from, or seedlings from, pardon me, and incidentally, one of them is Norm Erickson. Yeah, one of the one of our little projects every fall is to go through the field before we pick and pick out the dogs and kill them. We, some of the bushes think they're out there to make pulpwood, not nuts, <laughs> and we kill them. We cut them off and poison them with uh, uh, glyph not glyphosate. We use an, a, a remedy or uh, Garlon Four. Uh, it's a herbicide with a. Uh, half life of a, just a couple of months in the soil, and uh, I've seen absolutely no collateral damage to any adjacent plants. And in fact, you can go back the next year and find grass and weeds growing right up against the poison stems. It's a marvelous herbicide. Probably the worst part of it is the diesel that we use for the carrier. I also want to mention that the uh, the Iowa Nut Growers Association is collaborating with uh, some partners. And through their Growers Wanted program, um, uh, growers that are interested in trying out some of these experimental genotypes, or we're putting them on a list, so that down the road, when some of these experimental genotypes become available to try out on, on growers' farms in research settings, we're, we're pretty selective in who we work with because the growers have to ha show us that they have the financial wherewithal to do a planting and then can commit to collecting data for up to five years. But if, uh, if folks are interested, get with uh, me at the Iowa Nut Growers Association, become a member, and I can get you some information on our Growers Wanted program. That's Norm again. Well, what I was getting at was we do sell seedlings from off our farm, and we plan our own. And we, we go through and select a few bushes every year and, uh, and save the seed and, and uh, propagate from them. But, of course, since they're open pollinated, some of them will be mutts that won't be very productive and some of them will be just excellent. I've got a couple of my bushes in the trials for micropropagation. So we we kill the bad bushes in our field every year, the worst ones in the field every year, so that we're trying to update the field genetics by getting the poor pollen out of the pollen cloud. Other questions? Yeah, there's Bound to be some more questions out there. <laughs> Not all I've uh, I, I've got one though for you, Jeff and Norm. I, you might have mentioned this, and maybe I missed it. But so, what kind of a, a lifespan are you looking at for these bushes? And and also, um, what's the the time to production from from when you're first planting? My my quickest bush to production was three years. Five or six is more typical. And uh, the production from a bush will increase each year for probably uh, eight or ten years. And they're like a lilac in the growth form. They'll get up, some of the tallest ones will get up 10, 12 feet. And uh, we haven't had really any issues with mechanical picking. They bend over and bow to the machine. And they go through the tunnel. Uh, but it seems that when the bushes get really large and they start shading themselves, then the productivity begins to fall off. The experience in, in Europe has been that they'll let the bushes go 10, 12 years, and then they coppice them at the ground. They let them grow back. It's just like lilacs in that regard. If you take a lilac bush that's 15 years old, you'll find the flowers are way up top where you can't reach them, and there's not very many anymore. And so if you cut them off at the ground, they put on a lot of new tissue, a lot of new stems, and uh, and reinvigorate themselves. And you can do that over and over again. And how do you prevent squirrels from stealing the crop? Well, you eat squirrels one, <laughs> one way. Have a terrier in the field is another. Um, or have a field, plant your plants where there's no adjacent woods. Uh, 
<laughs> squirrels are pretty aggressive. We we dry our nuts in uh, mesh bags, and they'll chew right through the bag. Yeah, the the squirrel issue is um, it can be challenging, but I tell you what, I think the blue jays are worse for me, and and, and the rabbits too. I want to mention that. So rabbits are a concern uh, early when the when the plants are small, they kind of nip off uh, some of the um, the plants. But typically, if there's a good root system there, they'll re-sprout from the root crown, and you'll be fine. I was surprised here two winters ago the amount of damage done uh, by rabbits that girdled, they ate the bark off, and really uh, decimated my planting. And that surprised me. Now, I'm situated right next to 40 acres of CRP wetland, and so there's plenty of habitat there for those rabbits, but uh, i got to get a hold of that, or uh, uh, got to get ahead of that, because they really did some damage on, on very mature, tall bushes uh, eating away the bark, and so that's a concern. I see there's a question about how many hazelnut growers are in Iowa right now. Uh, I would say certainly we have uh, a dozen or so. Uh, none of them would be commercial. Everybody's got just a few plants that they're... Uh, they're looking to do uh, some research on and get a better feel for it. Um, and one final thing, I, not final thing, but one thing I want to mention is um, hazelnuts have been around for a while and they've been promoted as a, as a third crop or a perennial crop for a while. And there's a lot of promotion and boosterism out there. But there's also a lot of misinformation and flat out lies that are out there. So I get calls on a pretty regular basis, uh, growers that might be calling from the East Coast or parts of the Midwest and say, hey, I heard about these plants that can do 5,000 pounds to the acre of hazelnuts. And, and I got to say, whoa, 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 hold up here. There's no production in the Midwest that's doing 5,000 pounds to the acre. Uh, another guy's trying to sell plants claiming that he has bushes that will produce 100 pounds of nuts per bush. And that's just completely ridiculous. Uh, the uh, most... Um, uh, most pounds per bush that's been published is uh, I think 16 or 17 pounds per bush from the University of Nebraska. Uh, even the Oregon nuts uh, aren't getting that out in Oregon and they're a, a well-defined and developed industry. So just really got to pay attention to who's saying what and if somebody's selling plants or seedlings, um, ask them more questions because um, uh, it's just important that growers don't get burned. Yeah, when we sell bushes, we sell bare root, and we dip our bushes in a, in a saturated hydrogel with a little bit of root growth stimulant so that the roots don't dry out in handling or during planting. And we uh, like to plant into a bare soil. We have planted into a hay ground where there's brome and timothy and alfalfa, and uh, they're pretty aggressive competitors for a bush that's maybe six, eight inches high, ten inches high. And uh, so weed control, some some cultural practice is really desirable. At the, I would, if I was planting, I would burn down the row where I'm going to plant and probably subsoil if there had been heavy equipment over the ground, if it's an old egg land. I see there's a question about do they need full sun, and just want to say that uh, hazelnuts as, as a species or as a as a species, I guess you could say, as part of the uh, oak savanna. So it would be like an understory crop along with uh, your wild grapes and your ribes and your gooseberries and all those types of things. So they can handle partial sun, um, and certainly they're going to do well in full sun. Um, it just depends on what your goal is. So if you're looking for production, give them full sun. If you're looking to do an agroforestry practice for another goal, whether that's wind, uh, wind uh, uh, reduction or snow uh, management, uh, then... Um, they can handle partial shade with another row of uh, conifers or something next to them. And one other uh, aspect that we haven't touched on, there are some hazel growers that are growing their hazels for finishing out hogs. The, the, because of the high oil content and the profile of the oils, it causes the fat to change and the flavor of the pork to change. And uh, people are growing what they refer to as uh, heirloom or old world hogs that take uh, longer to mature, maybe three years. But when they're skinned out, they say the fat is not dry looking. It's real oily. And uh, they get a very, very high dollar for those. That, and uh, people that are doing that are selling to high-end chefs in Chicago and Minneapolis, for example. They don't even pick them. They just pasture the hogs in the hazels. They, they eat them off the ground as they find them or what they can reach. And the, the old world hogs, they don't have to wring their noses because they're not rooters, they're grazers.
Anything else? Yeah, it looks like uh, Tom might have another question here. We do got some time if you got a got something on your mind that you haven't spoke up about. Yeah, yeah, Jeff and Norm, you guys need to take this. You need to take this show on the road. You guys are a great duo for this. It, I listen to a lot of baseball on the radio, and you remind me of like a you know Jeff doing the play-by-play, -play, Norm the color commentator. You guys got a lot of good insight. We've had a lot of fun over the years uh, promoting hazelnuts and trying to get growers excited. Uh, at least try them. Uh, don't go overboard, but at least try them. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody would like to come up and visit us for a tour, get, get in touch. We're in the phone book here in Lake City. It's kind of like going to the circus. <laughs> <laughs> we have a green, greenhouse and some funny-looking machines and a lot of bushes to look at. We like visitors. And everybody gets to hear a polka or more. And we, we have played music to our plants when we started. We bought some Sonic Bloom CDs, and I got outside speakers on the stereo system. So when I'm not playing old-time music, for me, I play uh, this other music for the plants. So I think the Iowa Nut Growers needs to organize a uh, field trip bus tour up to Norm. So we'll work yeah. on that. Yeah. yeah, cool. Norm, what would be a good time of year to come visit and see the plants in production and you know maybe before yeah. harvest? <laughs> the, 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 I mean, uh, every day is a good day out there, but uh, I'd say from a tour standpoint, late summer best to see the bushes, see the crop on the bushes. We pick in September, mid-September, pretty typical, mid-September to early October. And uh, so at that time, generally, the conditions are more predictable. And it's more interesting to see what's going on. But if you want to see processing, then you come in the middle of winter. Right now, I think we picked about 370 bags of nuts, and I'm about 80, 85% done husking. I haven't really started cracking yet. I've been dragging my feet to get my new cracker operational before I get into that, because it's going to work so good. <laughs> Cool. Good. Well, it looks like uh, we've exhausted the questions in the chat box here, so now's a good time, I guess, to wrap it up. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in and listening to this, and, and a big thank you to Norm and a big thank you to Jeff for putting the time into this presentation. There's a lot of great information here. We're glad to have this gonna, recorded and in our archives, so thank you, guys. I'm going to key in my uh, email if anybody wants to uh, talk oh, great. about a, a trip to visit. It's Hazelnut Source. Thank you very much. That's that's fantastic. At Gmail. And I just want to say a final word. Uh, eat more nuts. Eat more nuts, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. If, if you cut these and if you tasted the nuts that we're growing, which you do if you come visit, you'll plant them just for your own consumption because they're so good you just can't believe how delicious they are until you eat them sounds like it's worth the trip right there thanks again guys everybody have a great weekend Hey, Norman, Jeff, it doesn't look like that email address came through in the chat box. Sorry, got it. Got it.